Today on The Hookup, I'm going to show you how to create the most secure smart home network possible by creating VLANs and firewall rules to separate your IoT and NOT devices from the rest of your network. This is part three, the final part of my ultimate smart home network series. Here we go. In part one of this series, I showed you how to pick the right networking hardware for your needs and price point. In part two, I showed you how to set up your new equipment, migrate from your old network, and start dividing your network based on device type. Today, I'm going to walk you through creating VLANs and firewall rules to make sure your network is as safe and secure as possible without limiting functionality. At this point, if you've been following along with this video series, you should have a fully functioning home network with multiple SSIDs being broadcast for your different device types. So far, all of your devices are on a single subnet and can all communicate with each other, which is not great since a single compromised IoT device could allow for a hacker to set up a tunnel into your home network. To segregate your network by device type, we're going to set up different virtual local area networks, or VLANs. You can think of each VLAN as a completely separate network with a different router, a different switch, and different access points. By default, one VLAN cannot access another VLAN any more than you can access your neighbor's home network from your own. The advantage of a VLAN, of course, is that you don't actually have to have separate equipment, since the separation is going to happen via software. The other advantage is that we can easily set up different firewall rules to only allow specific traffic to be able to cross the VLANs. To set up the first VLAN, we're going to click on Settings, Network, and then Create New Network. I'm going to call this network IoT and select corporate for the purpose, LAN as the network group, assign it to VLAN 20, and then I'm going to change the IP range of this group to 192.168.20.1/24. You don't have to have the VLAN number match the subnet, but it makes it easier to remember. Press the update DHCP range button, click the box that says enable IGMP snooping, and then hit save and you're all done with that network. We're going to repeat those same steps for our NOT VLAN. Hit create new network, call it NOT, select corporate, leave LAN as the network group, and then for this one I'm going to set it as VLAN 30 and make my subnet 192.168.30.1/24. Hit update DHCP range and enable IGMP snooping and then press save. That covers the VLANs for NOT and IoT devices, but I have one more device type on my network my PoE IP security cameras. These devices don't need to talk to anyone or anything. Basically, each camera produces a video stream called RTSP, and if you want to see that stream, you can connect to the camera directly. But the camera doesn't need to contact any other device, except for NTP requests for time synchronization, but we're going to allow all the devices on our network to do that. I originally had my IP cameras on another VLAN as well, but I noticed some degradation in the quality of the stream when doing so. I did some research and I wasn't able to find a definitive answer as to why that was occurring, but there was some speculation that some of the hardware offloading that allows the USG to be such a high throughput router cannot be used across VLANs. And since 9 video streams ranging from 2 to 6 megapixels represents quite a bit of data, it could cause some slowdowns. I'll show you how I regulate their traffic when we set up the firewall rules, but just know for now I'm not going to set up a separate VLAN for them. So now you've got different VLANs, what's the point? Well, firewall rules is the point. We're going to be able to manage the exact traffic that's allowed to travel across VLANs by writing different rules for our internal firewall. Go to Settings, Routing and Firewall, and then click on Firewall on the top. You'll see that there's lots of different areas that we can apply firewall rules, but the most efficient place to regulate traffic is directly at the front door of the router, before any resources are wasted on determining a route. The tab titled LAN IN corresponds to that front door, so that's where we're going to create all of our rules. Basically, when we set up firewall rules, they're processed from the top down. So if the traffic is allowed to pass based on a rule that's higher up on the list, it will not then be subsequently blocked by a rule that's lower on the list. To make things easier on myself, I always make specific firewall rules for allowing traffic and then broad rules for dropping traffic. Then I put all the allow rules at the top and the drop rules at the bottom. The first rules we need to create are the ones that apply to all the IP addresses on the network. And the most important one is the rule to allow established and related sessions. This is a really common rule that exists on basically all routers at the WAN level. This is what allows a website or service to talk back to your computer if you establish the initial connection. Since we're going to be blocking the other networks from communicating with the LAN later on, we need to establish a rule to let them answer if they're talked to. 
To do this, click on LAN in and then create new rule. I always name my rules with whether or not they're going to be accepting or dropping traffic. So I'm going to call this one allow established and related sessions. Select accept and then under advanced click on established and related. And then for source, we'll need to create a group that contains all the possible IP addresses on all the VLANs. So for me, that's 192.168.86.0 slash 24, 192.168.30.0 slash 24, and 192.168.20.0 slash 24. I'll call this group all local IP addresses and then select that group for both the source and the destination. I also want to allow all the devices on the network to send NTP or time synchronization requests. These requests will always go out on port 123, so I'm going to create a rule called accept all NTP requests, then select accept, and under source I'll select all local IP addresses, and then under destination I'm going to create a port group called NTP that only contains port 123. There are other options for taking care of this NTP problem like creating custom DNS entries to redirect traffic to a local NTP server or doing fancy routing to trick the NTP traffic, but this solution is plenty secure for now. Next, let's configure your NOT firewall rules. For me, my NOT needs to be able to communicate via MQTT with my MQTT server, so I'm going to create a rule called allow NOT to MQTT. I'm going to select accept and then under source I'll select the NOT network and under destination I'll select the address port group and I'll add a new group under IP addresses that I'll call home assistant with my specific home assistant server IP address since that's where my MQTT server lives. And then under port group I'll add a new group called MQTT ports that will contain the two most common MQTT ports which are 1883 for non-secure traffic and 8883 for secure MQTT traffic. The next accept rule that I need is one to allow my IoT network to access my home assistant server, or specifically my node red server. I only need this because I use the Alexa local node to configure all of my echo voice commands. If you don't use Alexa local, you probably don't need this rule. Anyways, I'll call it allow IoT to home assistant. I'll select accept and then for source I'm going to select my IoT network and for destination I'm going to put in the IP address of my home assistant virtual machine. I could enter this as a singular IP address but I like to use groups instead because they can be descriptive and I already have this group defined from my previous rule. These are all the basic accept rules that will probably apply to your smart home but you may need other ones based on the devices that you have. For instance Chromecast uses ports 8008 8009, 5556, 5558, and 5353, and it uses those for advertising and casting. So for me, I needed to add a firewall rule to allow my IoT network to communicate on those ports specifically. Furthermore, I wanted to limit that traffic to only the Chromecast devices, so I created a group called Chromecast Devices using their specific IP addresses, and I selected that as the source, and then I added those ports to a group called Chromecast, and added that as the destination. If you notice something on your network doesn't function after imposing firewall rules, you can generally figure out which ports they need for their services with a quick Google search. All right, that does it for all the accept rules. Now it's time to start blocking traffic. Our IoT network isn't allowed to talk to the LAN or the NOT network, so we'll make a rule called block IoT from LAN, select drop, and then under source select the IoT network, and under destination select the LAN network. Repeat that exact same process to block the IoT from the NOT network. Next, we need to create the rules that block the NOT. Remember the NOT only needs to communicate with the MQTT server, which we've already accepted. So all that's left is to drop the rest of the traffic. Create a rule called block all NOT and then select drop. For source, select the NOT network and then for destination we're going to create a group that contains every possible IPv4 address. So I'll call it all IP addresses and I'll start with 0.0.0.0/1, then 128.0.0.0/2, then 192.0.0.0/3, and last 224.0.0.0/4. Select that as the group and then hit save. As I mentioned earlier, IP cameras don't need to communicate at all, except for with the time synchronization server over NTP, which we already allowed by one of our first rules. And again, the reason that I didn't put the cameras on a VLAN is that there seemed to be some kind of a performance drop when routing that much data constantly over a VLAN. 
So instead, I'm gonna create an IP address group called cameras, and then I'm gonna add in each of my camera's IP addresses manually. Then I'll create a rule called block all cameras. I'll select drop, and for the source, I'll select the IP cameras group, and then for destination, I'll select the all IP addresses group. If you ever need to edit these groups later on, you can do it under routing and firewall, firewall, and then groups. Since we specified this group based on specific IP addresses, we need to make sure that those IP addresses aren't gonna change. So if you haven't done it already, you should go to clients and then select each camera, click on the gear and then network, and then turn on the used fixed IP toggle. It will autofill the current IP address of the device, but you can also specify another IP in this area if you'd like. The last thing that we need to allow in order for our smart home devices to function as expected is we need to enable something called multicast DNS or MDNS. Basically, these devices are gonna advertise their IP address and their services to all the other devices on the VLAN. This is required for things like device discovery on Amazon Echo devices and Chromecast streaming. Multicast traffic can cause significant slowdowns on a network, since even though it's a small amount of data, multicast takes a relatively long time to process in each access point. We've already enabled IGMP snooping to try to control some of that multicast data, but in a smart home, multicast is a necessary evil, so we can't just block it completely. In order to allow MDNS, we need to turn off a feature under Site Settings. So go to Settings, and then Site, and then turn off the setting that says Auto Optimize Network and Wireless Performance. We need to do this because disabling MDNS will certainly increase wireless performance, but it's gonna stop all of your devices from working properly, so it's a trade-off that we need. Now that all the rules are in place, we can force our devices onto their respective VLANs. To do this for our wireless devices, we'll go to Settings and then Wireless Networks and first select your IoT SSID and click Edit. Under Advanced Options, we're gonna click on Use VLAN and select VLAN 20, since that's the VLAN that we assigned to our IoT network earlier. Make sure that the button to block LAN to WLAN multicast and broadcast data is unchecked. Also, down at the bottom, check the Enable Multicast Enhancement button. This is the second step to allowing your Unify equipment to optimize the multicast data so that it doesn't slow down your network too much. Repeat this process for your NOT network, but assign it to VLAN 30 and then make sure that LAN to WLAN multicast button is unchecked, and then enable multicast enhancement and press save. While we're at it, I got a great suggestion to eliminate some unnecessary SSID broadcasting by disabling the five gigahertz NOT SSID, since none of my NOT devices are capable of doing five gigahertz. Do this by clicking devices and then APs, then select an AP and click on the gear. Under WLANs, select the 5 GHz NOT network and toggle the Enabled on this AP switch. Then hit Q Changes and then Apply. After all of your APs provision and your wireless networks come back online, you should have a theoretically functioning network. But many of your IoT devices may not function well. The problem is that those MDNS broadcasts by default can't cross VLANs. So what we need to do is repeat those MDNS broadcasts across all the different VLANs. Luckily, the Unify controller makes this pretty easy. All we need to do is go to Settings, Services, then MDNS, and turn on Multicast MDNS. This, along with the unchecked box for blocking multicast, lets devices broadcast their IP addresses across all the VLANs, which should allow them to function properly. And the IMGP snooping should take those multicast requests and send them only to the devices that need to hear them, which lowers the effect on the network. It's worth noting here that even though those devices are advertising their IP addresses, it doesn't mean that they'll be able to be reachable since they still have to obey the firewall rules that we set up earlier. Now that all of your settings are in place, it's a good idea to go through and test your most used smart home integrations to make sure that they're still working as intended in order to not lose too much of that wife approval factor. Setting up a network like this isn't cheap and it's not that quick but it's orders of magnitude more secure than letting all of your IoT devices from various manufacturers co-mingle with your trusted devices. If you follow along with this video, your network should be fully functional and secure, but I've only scratched the surface of what's possible with this equipment. In future videos, I'll cover VPNs, presence detection, custom DNS, and other advanced functionality, but you don't need to wait for me. There are plenty of other YouTubers making great networking content right now. 
Two of my personal favorites are Chris from Crosstalk Solutions and Willie Howe, and you should check them out if you haven't already. Remember that I'm not a network administrator by trade, and while I did consult with professionals while I was making this video, I'm not claiming that what I've set up is the only way or even the best way. If you have something to add or I got something wrong, please let me know down in the comments. Thank you to all of my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more like it, please consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.